Uh, this morning, we look at uh, our next animal and stories from the stable. We've covered uh, uh, two thus far. We've covered, uh, well, do you know which ones we've covered? Do you remember? You're all new. It's your first Sunday. And we, what was the first one we covered? The donkey. We covered the donkey. Then we covered the, the goat based on Yom Kippur. And then today, we're going to look at, you guessed it, the camel. You're cheating. You're probably looking behind me, right? The cam- The camel. What in the world can you learn from a camel? When I, when I chose this as a series, I'd never done it before, and uh, I'm thinking about a camel. It's like, what in the world am I going to say about a camel? And as I got into this and studying this, I'm realizing this is like a three or four part series. <laughs> I'm serious. I know it's shocking, but it really is. And, uh, but I had to limit it to what I was, wanted to say, as we'll see today. There's much about camels to learn from, spiritually speaking. But let's first look at what can you learn from a camel just pragmatically. Have you ever ridden one? How many have actually ridden one? Yeah, see, this is a church that is in the know. You know, I mean, our people are, have been all over the world, you know. So um, I want to tell you about the first time I rode a camel in the Middle East. Um, it was right after 9-11. took a tour group over there, my first tour group. Went with a Jewish friend of mine, a Messianic Jew. Uh, he was teaching me how to do these tours, how to lead people. And, uh, and so I, I like practical jokes. And so uh, we decided to pull a joke on our tour group. I mean, why not? Right after 9-11, you know, there was no one in Israel. Tourism was down 75%. Uh, the State Department said, don't go. We went anyway, and I'm glad we did because we had all the sites to ourselves. It was really nice. Uh, and then all my other subsequent trips, I've had the entire world at those sites, so that first one was special. But we, uh, we played a trick on our, on our uh, tour group. Uh, what we did is when we, um, we left uh, Jerusalem, headed south toward the Judean wilderness, uh, you know, out toward the, the Dead Sea, you know, God forsaken, you know, what, 1,600 feet below sea level, hot, totally hot down there. So we headed to the Judean wilderness, uh, and what we decided to do was uh, we told the uh, Israeli guide and we told the, uh, the, the uh, Israeli um, bus driver that we wanted them to fake the bus breaking down in the middle of nowhere. I mean, like, why not, you know? <laughs> so, so we're driving along, and so we had arranged to have lunch at this Bedouin tent in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and, um, but nobody else knew that, just us. And so we were driving along and all of a sudden, the, you know, we're in the middle of the desert and the, on, on the side of this, just rolling hills of nothing, no trees or anything. And all of a sudden the bus starts sputtering and, and gets a little speed and then sputters a little more. And eventually he just pulls over the side of the road and, you know, he gets on the intercom. My friends, it's over. You know, it's <laughs> no more bus, you know, and that was it. And uh, so everybody's like talking among themselves. This is, we're going to die out here. It's unbelievable. You know, I don't see any gas stations. There's nowhere to go. You know, what are we going to do? They were, they were absolutely freaking out. And, uh, and so we played it up, you know, as best we could for as long as we could. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and so we finally said, hey, basically, we're looking at our options. Our options are not great. It's not like America where you dial 911 and, you know, the police department shows up. You know, uh, I don't even think we, we don't have a cell range out here. Uh, but there, there's a Bedouin tent way over there, maybe three quarters of a mile away over there on that hill. You can see the red tent and everything. Um, let's, let's, let's walk over there. Walk out, over your, out of your mind, you know. And so we said, we'll walk. And so we decided that was our best option. So we started walking with the whole tour group over there in the middle of the desert. Uh, and uh, they're just, they're, you know, complaining. They're worried. It was me. They were exactly like the Israelites when we started out. I'm serious. <laughs> they're like Moses. It's like, this is a joke and unbelievable. So we get over there, and the Bedouin greets us. You know, my friends, it's wonderful. And uh, after a few minutes, when they saw the Bedouin tent and the food set up for dinner, then they realized, oh, yeah, you totally got us on that one. It's like, yes. It was great. Now, while we were there, and I won't pull that trick on you when we're over there. I've already let you know that one. Maybe another one. But uh, while we were there, he had had some camels. He had three. He had a mother and and two of her babies that were now uh, grown. And so those are what he was offering our tour group, part of the package that we worked out to go for camel rides. And so everybody was all excited. Wouldn't you want to ride a camel? I mean, you're in the Middle East, you know, et cetera. So there they were. And so uh, like a single hump type camel, and was, they were all saddled up and ready to go. And, and so uh, <laughs> immediately, people jumped on the smaller ones. They were easier to get onto because they were shorter. And they, they were on those saddles. They're ready to go. And I'm like, wow, that leaves me and this Marine I'm with for the, the mother, this female. Uh, She was not having a good day, uh, I'm saying. She was very moody that day, from what I found out. And uh, there was two seats on her. There was one at the back, a smaller seat, easier to get into because it's closer to the ground. And then the main saddle, it wasn't really a saddle, as it were, but that's what they called it. Uh, And immediately, I turn around, and the Marines already jumped in the uh, the easier seat. (laughs) Marines. They're already. He's ready to go. I look there, and he's already in the chair. And I'm like, wow, uh, thanks. He goes, hey, Pastor, I gave you the front seat. I'm like, well, thanks a lot. Uh, 
And so I was walking over there where he was, where the camel was, and I walked in front of her. Never walk in front of a camel. Did you hear me? Never walk in front of a camel. Bad things happen when you walk in front. But I'm from San Diego. How many camels are in San Diego? There's palm trees. There's no camels. And if they're there, they're at the San Diego Zoo. I mean, that's about it. Uh, and so I'd never been up close and personal. So I'm walking by in front of this, 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 this uh, female, this mom. Uh, she was not excited that we were there. And now I know this is hyperbolic. Just go with it, okay? Her mouth opened like four feet. <laughs> wow. I mean, just silently. Wow. And I stood there like a Westerner going, whoa, that's cool. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> never walk in front of them. Never stand there when they're opening their mouth, Okay. And I'm, I'm seeing her open her mouth, and I, I'm just thinking to myself, it's in the morning, maybe it's a yawn, etc. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, it wasn't. Um, next thing I know, I haven't even got there yet. I won't even tell you all the gory details. <laughs> but the next thing I know, a blast, a primal scream comes out of her interior section, out her mouth, whoa, and screaming at me. My hair is blowing back. My clothes are vibrating. I'm like, oh, my it was the worst smell in all of time. I was frozen. I was, it almost physically took me out. And my wife's in dentistry, so the first thing I analyze is teeth. You know, I'm looking at her teeth. They're green. They're brown. There's hay stuff wrapped around them. And I'm like, you need floss, something. I'm less like, this is the grossest thing I have ever seen. Smelt unbelievable. Well, it, it, when you're in the field of fire, you want to get out of the field of fire, Right? I was direct, dead center. I, I got to get out of here. So I, I banked it to the right, got, out, got away from her, and she was not happy. And so then I had to get in the saddle with this mother that was not too happy that I was standing there. And so I reached up and I grabbed kind of like what was the horn of the saddle, but it wasn't like a Western saddle. So I grabbed something to grab you know, hold of. And I have a pretty good grip, so I grabbed it, then just pulled myself up. So I was swinging my right leg over, and she stood up. <laughs> <laughs> she timed it perfectly. <laughs> so there I am. Hand on that little horn thing, hanging, swinging on the side of this camel, feet off the ground. I got the Marine behind me going, get up there, man. Push, pull yourself up there. I'm not a Marine. I'm a pastor. Uh, and I'm definitely past pulling myself up here. So I'm sitting there hanging there. And then you know, there's some things that are just universal in cultures, you know? I mean, stuff that just transcends time. I mean, every culture just gets it. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm sitting there hanging there, and this little Bedouin guy with the Bedouin guard, the, you know, the whole headdress and everything, he comes over to me. I kid you not, he, he puts his little hands like this, and he goes, Pastor, <laughs> what does that mean? It's a step. It's a step. Put my foot in there, was able to get up on the, the camel, and it was awesome. I went for a ride. The very first thing that, that dawned on me as she got moving was... How did Abraham do this? I mean, I'm telling you, okay, when you're writing them, it's like a drama meme moment. <laughs> now, not that I get motion sickness, but I mean, you're going, every, you, you are being dislocated as she's moving because one side of your body is going that way and then it's back and then it's over and then it's back and you're like, I'm getting sick. I went off. I mean, it was just like, how did Abraham ride this from Ur the Chaldees to Palestine, 600 miles? I'm thinking, I'm not even going to make it from here to the wall. I mean, this is unbelievable. So what did I learn from a camel physically? A couple lessons, and I've shared them with you already, and I'll, I'll principalize them for you. For whenever you take a trip to the Middle East, remember my lessons. Number one, never, did you hear me? Stand never stand in front of a camel. Never, and they spit too, I'm telling you. Never stand in front of a camel, okay? What else? never stand there if their mouth is open, all right? And if you are going to do that, have a hazmat suit, fully air, oxygen, the whole shebang, they can totally take you out. That's what you can learn from them physically speaking, which leads to a natural point. What can you learn from them theologically? Have you analyzed them from a theological perspective? I have. And they are full of information to learn from, as we're going to see, that directly relates to Christ. And we, before we get into what we want to learn about a camel, I want to make two foundational points. Because when you read the biblical narrative about the, the, you know, Jesus in the stall with the animals, I mean, you hear the cattle lowing and all that kind of stuff. You don't see camels. So what are we talking about? It's a, it's a supposition I'm making, an assumption based on the following facts. Number one. They had to be near the stable because basically from my perspective, a camel in that day was kind of like a beamer. You know, BMW. Like, if you were wealthy, you owned one of these things. I mean, think about it. If you were poor, what were you riding? Donkey. Donkey. 
And if you're really poor, sandals. You know what I'm saying? And you graduated up, you got the donkey. If you got a camel, it's like, hey, you got it going on. I mean, you got a camel. So if they're in Bethlehem for the census and all that stuff, don't you know there was a few wealthy people? What are they driving? Camel. If you have a camel at the hotel, where are you going to valet park that thing? I'm just saying. Where are you going to valet park it? Stable. Stable. Why? You got to feed it. (laughs) Got to feed it. So I'm thinking that when Jesus was in that stable, there had to be a camel either outside or inside that stable, depending on how large it was. By definition, of that's what they drove back then. Uh, Number two, think about the Magi. They came from Ur the Chaldees, Mesopotamia. What was their mode of transportation? You you only got a couple options. (laughs) Probably not a donkey. A camel. camel. You seen the pictures when you're shopping on the cards? Camels. In fact, on a, a Jordanian dinar... Jordanian dinar, that's worth a little under a dollar. There are one, two, three, three camels on a Jordanian dinar. Not dinner, dinar. Don't you find this interesting? I do. They're still remembering the the value of a camel, uh, even on their modern currency. I find that totally fascinating. Uh, I won't tell you how I got it. Um, Moving on, what do camels teach us? Well, two miracles are going to transpire this morning. Number one, um, I'm only have one point. For this whole sermon. <laughs> yeah, only one. When does that ever happen? You're going to be able to just sit back, relax, one point. If you leave here this morning thinking, hey man, I don't even know what he was talking about. Uh, I can't help you. It's only one point, okay? <laughs> what do we learn from a camel? I'm going to give you one point. Number two, that one point is going to come from 67 verses. <laughs> Why are you laughing, okay? If you were to tell a friend of yours, hey, come to my church, listen to my pastor, you know, he moves quickly through Bible passages. How long would it basically take for me to move through 67 verses? We're talking a couple years. Yeah, a couple years. So the second miracle today is not only one sermon point, we're going to cover 67 verses in the next 20 minutes. So I want you to listen to me. Don't time me, but I'm just saying. This is going to be amazing. As we look at Genesis chapter 24, it's a chapter that has camels everywhere. And they're everywhere for good reason. Because here's my only point I'm going to talk about all morning. Remember, I told you, only one point. What do they teach us? What do camels teach us? Well, you can read it. It's in English. Fulfillment. Camels teach us about what? Fulfillment. fulfillment of the promise. You weren't all with me. What do they do? They teach us about the fulfillment of the promise. The promise. It didn't say a promise. It's the oh. promise. Really? What promise? Uh, Abraham. Remember Abraham. Abraham uh, was called from Ur of the Chaldees, Mesopotamian area, uh, by God to be the first uh, uh, apostolic prophet, as it were. God takes him over to the Holy Land, uh, says, I'm going to make you a great man of a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. I'm going to make your, your progenitors as, as, as plentiful as the stars in the sky, the sand of the sea. I, you're going to be a, the father of a mighty nation, uh, and I'm going to give you uh, land parameters that you're going to enjoy. And he gives them land parameters all throughout Uh, The book of Genesis starts in chapter 12, by the way. Uh, And that's the promise. The Abrahamic promise was not conditional. It's unconditional. God seals the covenant himself. It's all on God. It's unconditional that he's going to bring the Messiah from Genesis 3.15 through Abraham and the Jewish people to the world to bless the world. But it's going to come through Abraham, the Messianic seed. And when you read through progressive revelation and you get to 2 Samuel chapter 7, you realize that not only was the Messiah going to come through uh, the, the promise given to Abraham, but it's going to come through oh, the Davidic line within Abraham's line. The Messiah will come to be the eternal one to rule and reign and bring his kingdom of peace. So keep all that in mind as you look at uh, chapter 24 of the book of Genesis, which is a, a passage all about camels helping Abraham and Isaac fulfill the messianic promise and i will then prove to you why i believe then camels were there with christ because it's only fitting based upon what this great passage says verse 1 of chapter 24 of the book of genesis now abraham was old advanced in age what's old when you're 50 you're thinking i'm feeling pretty good when you're 80 you're thinking i'm feeling pretty good but then you look down at your body and what happened you know that's what an 80 year old man told me one day. You know, it's maybe not the same body, but you're still feeling pretty good. Advanced in age. When my mom got married to my dad uh, during the Korean War, uh, she was 15 and he was 21. Uh, and right after she had her 16th birthday, they got married. I mean, like the next week. 
had, my, had me right away. I remember my mom in, in her 20s, etc. I mean, I get it. You know, and I remember when I was a little kid, my mom's friends are in their 20s. They were talking about how old they were. And I used to think as a little kid, man, they are old. They're 27. <laughs> when I hit 27, I'm thinking, I don't, I'm not old, you know. Uh, advanced in age. How old is advanced in age? Uh, well, he's 140. We're talking oxygen tank, walker, everything. I mean, he's bent over, no telling, 140, advanced in age, which means his son is 40. Who's his son, by the way? Isaac is a son. He's 40. Now, he has an issue at 40 because he's, he's unmarried at 40. Interesting. And we'll come back to that. Verse 1. Uh, the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Boy, had he. Uh, and Abraham said to his servant, uh, and we're not going to get into the theology of who the servant was because nobody really knows all the arguments pro and, you know, con, Eliezer, yes, no. We're not going to get into that. He's an unnamed servant. Um, he, uh, he said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, uh, please place your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you will go to my country. Where was he from? Mesopotamia, Ur the Chaldees. You go to my relatives, the country of my relatives, and take a wife for my son Isaac. So you are my head servant. I want you to travel back to my homeland. I've been there for many, many years. Sure, they remember me, but I don't know them anymore because they're so far away. Um, but I want you to find a wife from my people, not from the Canaanites. My son's 40. If you're 40 and single, do you want your dad picking your mate? <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? My dad picked my wife for me, Liz. Did he not, Liz? Yes. When I was in college in Los Angeles at Zeus Pacific University in 1976 to 80, the girl-guy ratio was five girls for every guy on campus. Mecca. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, and my parents moved to San Diego. My dad's going to work out of the federal building in San Diego. My dad calls me, uh, and, you know, in 79, says I got a new house, you know, live in, live in Poway, California. Uh, and, hey, uh, son, you need to come home this summer. Don't stay up in L.A. and working like I had done. Stay, you come down to San Diego because there's really, there's two pretty twins that live next door, and you need to come check them out. I'm like, <laughs> give me a break, dad. Number one, you're not picking my girlfriend. Number two, it's a five to one ratio. I'm doing the math. He kept talking to me. Kept, she's, they're cute. They're cute. Okay. Okay. I came home. Summer 79. Got engaged. <laughs> <laughs> Did, didn't we? You know, and my daughter has said many, many times, she's like, Dad, how do you know when it's the one? How do you answer that question? You know what I'm saying? I mean, is there a checklist? No. I ju you just know. You know, how do you spot a Canaanite? <laughs> I'm just asking. Have you ever dated a Canaanite? Now you're getting all quiet. You're meddling with me. Have you ever dated a Canaanite? No? no? Oh, I, I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. I dated a Canaanite. One of those girls that came out with the ring number during boxing matches in L.A. My parents freaked out. Freaked out. They kept telling me, son, don't do this with your life. You know, you're going to be a pastor. You can't. No way. That's not going to work, etc. I listen to my parents. I listen to my parents. And I submit to you, not that I'm talking about dating, but you should be listening to your parents. Because they have a lot of wisdom. Even if you're 40. You should be listening to them. He's 40 years old. He doesn't have a, have a wife. And he says, don't pick them from the Canaanites. Why? Because they're spiritually compromised. They don't worship the living God. They're sexually compromised because they were immoral people. They wedded their sexual activities to their worship of their gods. He says, I, I, don't, I don't want a woman for my wife, the promised son from those women. Go find one from my, my people. What were the prob what's the probability that at 40 years old, uh, Isaac could actually find a bride? Because I've heard all the arguments. You know, when you're 40, the field is narrowed on me. There's not a whole lot to choose from. If I choose at 40, they're going to have a lot of baggage. I don't want to do that. What am I going to do? You know what I'm saying? I've heard all this stuff. So I went to this website. This is out of curiosity. Uh, you might want to put this down if you're single. <laughs> I'm just saying. www.brainmeasuresplural.com. Okay? What is that about? It's a calculation site for dating. I, I kid you not. So what I did is I put in four, I acted like I was Isaac. I put my name in, how many times, you know, how many times have you dated in the last month, last year, blah, 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 put in all the variables, hit the button, calculate, and it came out with this figure, 32% was the ratio. He had a 32% chance that he was going to get married in his lifetime. Not, not super fantastic odds, but here's the point. He's the son of the Abrahamic promise. He has to get married. Here's the thing. The, the ratio could have been 2%. 
But God has a plan for Isaac's life. See what I'm saying? God's bigger than your situation. If you're 40 and not, and not married and you're thinking the field is narrowed, what, who am I going to choose from? Number one, God's in control. And if he has this for you, it shall happen. Uh, and he might surprise you in an amazing way as he's going to do with, uh, with Abraham and his son Isaac. Verse 5, it says, the, the servant said to him, okay, I'm going to do this, but suppose I get there and the woman's not willing to follow me to this land. No, uh, I mean, think about it. He's a logical Jewish servant. Uh, should I take your son back to me to the land where you came? I mean, shouldn't Isaac go? I mean, think about the logic. You're going to travel from the Negev area of southern Israel all the way up to Damascus, up to Aleppo, hang a right, and go over to the city of Nahor, which is off of a little branch of a river called the Bila, uh, right over there. And it's about 425 miles on a camel. And he's just thinking to himself, suppose I show up there, and the young lady says, to me, a total stranger, you want me to go back and marry some guy I've never seen before? I don't even know you. Are you out of your mind? Suppose she says no. <laughs> Isn't that logical? So he says, why can't I just take Isaac with me? Why would he be going? Well, if he's on a camel and he finds the woman to be, he then has to look at the woman and go, how do you feel about her? And then he can tell the young woman, how do you feel about him? Do you, I mean, can you look at his face for the next 40, 50 years? Is that the kind of personality you like? Is that the kind of woman you're looking for? Now, and what, is, what does Abraham say? Verse 6, Abraham said to him, hmm, good argument, but beware that you do not take my son back there. <laughs> oh, uh, and the Lord, of, the Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my, the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me saying, to your descendants, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife from my son from there. Wow. When he's talking about the land, he's talking about the promised land. He's basically telling him, you cannot take Isaac back there. He's in the promised land. He needs a wife to propel the promise forward. He, you can't take him there. Why? Well, let's keep on reading. Verse 8. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this, my oath. Only do not take my son back there. He just said it twice. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and he swore to him concerning their cultural fashion, concerning that matter. Interesting. He told him twice, don't take my son back there. Why not? He's afraid that if his son gets back there, finds a beautiful woman that he really falls in love with, and it's from his people, etc., he may stay there. Wrong country. Where is he supposed to be? Land of promise. Why? Because the Messiah is going to come through this family line. you got to be in the right place, son. You can't leave. So he sends him out. He sends him out with a patriarchal uh, warning and a, and a promise that if she doesn't want to come, then, you, then you're free. Because there's a great probability that she would not want to come. Because you can imagine, would you go as a young lady? We'll get into the story. It's most interesting. Now, enter the camels. What do the camels got to do with this? Every, the whole story is built around the camels. Verse 10 says, Then the servant took the ten camels, how many? Ten. Ten, ten camels from the camels of his master, and he set out with a variety of good things of his, from his master's hand uh, to give to the young lady in question. Uh, and he arose, and he went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor, which is about uh, 200 or 425 miles. Uh, it's just, it's uh, like uh, due east of Aleppo. Uh, and so they went up to Damascus. They took the ancient highway up the coastline. They went to Damascus. They took a, a camel ride about 100 miles up to Aleppo. They hung a right turn, did about 80 miles over to Nahor, uh, located on the uh, Bali River, which is an offshoot of the Euphrates. And he's looking for God to lead him. And he said, Abraham told him, the same angel that led me will lead you. Which, if you look at this from a dating perspective, which is another sermon series, but think about it. If you're dating, who's going with you as a godly person? God. And he's sending who to help you that you can't see? Angel. Angelic assistance. Don't you know they have been in your life? The whole time. The whole time. And you'll meet them one day, and they'll be telling you, totally spared you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not her. You may think it's her. It's not her. Okay, okay, okay. Breaking up with her. Move to the next one. And all of a sudden, things aren't working out. It's not going right. It doesn't seem right. Not the one. Angel's telling you, move on, man. You go to the third one, and then all of a sudden, you meet the right one, like I did 36 years ago, right. and you find out, Bingo, will of God, right? Am I, am I talking, you understand what I'm talking about? You got the right one? Yeah, yeah. Verse 11, he takes these camels. It's totally interesting. Verse 11, he, take, he made the camels when he gets to the city in question, kneel down beside the city by the well of water at the evening time, the time when the women go out to draw water, when it's not hot. He's so strategic. 
He takes the 10 camels, they park outside the well, and they're waiting for the woman in question. <laughs> That's a plan. If that was your plan, <laughs> today, you're the servant sent out to go find a young woman for your 40-year-old single guy of your boss. Where would you plant yourself in our culture if you're the man in question, the servant? I'm thinking Tyson's mall. I'm just saying. I'm not going to hang outside Lowe's, you know. No, no, no. You'll be there a long time. No, not her. No. Uh, <laughs> let's think about this. I'm going to go to Fair Oaks Mall and park the camels out there, sit, head in with the men, and like, which store? I mean, if they head over to Sears, the tool section, not happening, right? DSW. We know, th- no. DSW, great. Are they in the mall, by the way? Yeah. Victor, well, there's other places you can go. I, I think I'm... <laughs> I'm thinking Forever 21. You know what I'm saying? Too young? This, I don't want to argue during my sermon. Just go with it. Okay. Nordstrom's or something. something. And just kind of hang out there. And you're just hanging out. Notice how, think of how funny this must have been. Camels lined up. All these men standing there. All the ladies coming out with the water. They're probably thinking, who are these weirdos? We don't know who these people are. They're sitting there with these camels. They got camels, which means they got money. Okay, we're moving on. Now, notice that they kneel down with the camels, and he has, the servant has a prayer. Because as another side note about dating, if you are dating, you should be praying. A lot. A lot. Why? You don't want to do what? Marry the wrong person. You want God, you got to help me. From this field that I'm choosing from, guide me. Uh, and God, he's praying. It's an interesting prayer. Notice what he says in verse 12. He said, the servant, as they're parked outside of Forever 21 or Nordstrom, or whatever you've got going on in your life. Oh, Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today. <laughs> no kidding. And show loving kindness to my master Abraham, period. Behold, I am standing by the spring, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. This is perfect. I'm adding to the text if you're looking to that. Verse 14. Now may it be, here comes a test. He's a Jewish guy. He's smart. And now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I might drink, and, he, and, he, and who answers, oh, drink, and I will water your camels also. Uh, may she be the one whom you've appointed for your servant Isaac, and by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. I, I just have a twofold test. We parked by the well. the well. We're lined up. Here they come. Which one? Okay, I got a test. First part of the test is water. She's got to give me a drink. Second part of the, and that could happen with any of the young women. Second part of the test is, she's got to water the camels. How many camels were there? Two, ten. Ooh, ten camels. That's a huge test, isn't it? Because if you're the young lady, the probability of you talking to a total stranger, I don't know how you raised your daughters. I'll tell you how I raised my daughter. Do not talk to men that you don't know. Amen. And don't, definitely don't go to the Negev with them on a donkey. Amen. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so you think about this, I mean, from a pragmatic perspective, it's unbelievable. He's praying, God, uh, here's the test, you know, and show me. Now, what I find most interesting is you got to do some calculations, all right? How many donkeys were there? Ten. Okay. What's the hump of a donkey for? Oh, what did I say, donkey? Oh, yeah, yeah. You try doing this three times in a row. It's, it's tough. Okay, go back to the camel. What's the hump on a camel for? Wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Sorry. Yeah, it's fat. That's all it is. You know what I'm saying? That's all it is. They can go six months without a drink. Where's the water? Stored in the rest of their body. <laughs> that digestive tract, bloodstream, etc. They are a water machine. They are a water machine. I mean, think about how much water they can drink. Uh, I did some reading this week. I get paid to study stuff like this. I find it fascinating. Uh, they can drink 53 gallons of water in less than 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, think about it. 53 gallons, like that's like a barrel. 53 gallons of water. And what was the test? Lord, might she give me a drink and water the camels? Plural. Okay? Do the math. 53 gallons of water times 10 camels is 530 gallons of water. That's like a tanker. What woman in her right mind is going to come out and do that? Unbelievable. Now, did he find the woman in question? Yeah, immediately. Immediately. Now, how long has Isaac been single? Four years. And all of a sudden, in a foreign land, with a servant, with a bunch of camels, bingo, God says, 
this is the woman. That's the providence of God. It says in verse 15, before he had finished speaking, behold, what happened? Rebekah, who was born of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. What'd she do? Well, it says the girl was very beautiful, a virgin. And no man had relations with her. And she went down to the spring and filled up her jar and came up. She's a godly young woman. She's a beautiful young woman. And she is a worker bee. Notice what it says, verse 17. Then the servant ran to meet her. He's all excited. And he said, uh, please let me drink a little water from your jar. Test one. Uh, and she said, you're a weirdo. I don't know you. Go away. Now, what'd she say? Drink, my lord. Uh, and he's thinking, bingo, test one. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. Now, when she had finished giving him a drink, she, didn't, he, she wasn't even prompted. And she said, I will draw also for your camels, plural, until they have finished drinking. So she emptied her, quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to draw well, water from the well, and she drew for all the cl- camels, plural. How many camels were there? Ten. Ten. How much did they drink? 530 gallons of water. How many trips <laughs> did Rebecca make to fill up the trough for those camels to drink? Now, a lot of trips. You know what? I would ter- dare say there would be a whole lot of women coming out of 4 over 21 that would not do this. <laughs> it's just too much work. I mean, because you, you think about the, the, the math of it all. I mean, think about the math of it all. I mean, based on the weight of water, uh, eight, eight, gallons per ga- eight uh, pounds per gallon, this is 4,240 pounds she moved. Man, I'm talking to you right now. You got a son. He's going to get married one day. What are you looking for? And I'm just asking, what, what are you looking for? A godly young woman, who's not a Canaanite as it were, a godly young woman, totally moral young woman, a hard worker. You don't want someone's going to sit around all the time being doted on. I mean, it's not bad to dote, but I don't get in trouble, but you want someone who understands Proverbs 31. This is a Proverbs 31 woman. That was a Rebecca. She understands how to work. She says, I'll volunteer to move 4,240 pounds of water to feed all those camels. What a woman. When you're looking at the next woman to be in the line of the Messiah that's going to bring in the kingdom through the Messiah, that's going to be the progenitor of the Israelite nation, you need a woman like this. And God says, that's her. She passed the test. In Genesis 24, 24, she says, you know, we read in the text, she said, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. This is stuff you read over when you're reading your Bible in a year. Uh, Boring genealogy stuff. Eh, Moving on. Shouldn't do that. She just told you some very interesting things theologically. Who's her father? Bethuel. Bethuel. He, and he's the son of Milcah. Milcah and uh, who's he from? Well, he's from Nahor. Who's Nahor? Hmm. Nahor is the brother of Abraham. Abraham. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Just happened that the servant ran into her. No, God had his hand in that. Uh, uh, Abraham uh, and Nahor, his brother, who was their father? It's Bible trivia time. Terah. Terah was their father. Uh, and when you follow Terah's uh, line back, uh, he's uh, from uh, the, he's one of the, uh, well, he's from the line of Shem, who's one of the sons of Noah. Well, who's Shem? Well, he's the line of the Messiah from Genesis 3.15. This is mind-boggling. Tin camel show up at a watering hole? The young lady shows up. She meets the test. God's hand's in it. She's the next in line to bring the Messiah to earth. Mind-boggling. And it happened in an out-of-the-way place. You know, when it didn't look like God was working, God was working big time. He said, Isaac, you wait for 40 years. I got the right woman for you at the right time. You're not going to believe how this is going to happen. Stay with me. Just be faithful. Rebecca, same thing, finds her, and God guides them. This is why it says in Genesis chapter 24, two times, in chapter 24, verse 27, and in verse 28, 48, the servant says two times, the Lord has led me. The Lord led him. And who was listening to all of this interchange? Camels. (laughs) I mean, imagine if they could talk. What were they saying? This is unbelievable. You know, <laughs> it's unbelievable. You're our friend the donkey? Hey, this is unbelievable. All these interconnections, they, they've led the right family to the right place at the right time. It's amazing. Now, the big question was, if, if you get to the end of the passage and skip all of the, of the discussion about, you know, the negotiations they go through to actually send her off, you know, whether she wants to go or not became the big question. It says in verse 57, as they're negotiating, should you go, should you not go? They said, just ask her. 
And so they said, we'll, we'll call the girl and they consult her wishes. Then they called Rebecca and they said to her, uh, will you go with this man? And she said, I'll go. Do you know what that meant? That meant she'd leave her mom and dad probably forever. That, that means she'd probably never see them again. That means she left all of her friends behind, all of her connections, all of her shopping, all that she did, everything that she was. She's going to leave it all behind to go to a foreign land 400 something miles away to meet a man she'd never met, to marry him, all because she believed it was the will of God. Mind-boggling. She says, I will go. Thus they sent her away, their sister Rebecca, and with her nurse, with Abraham's servant and his man. They blessed Rebecca, and they said to her, may you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. Boy, did that become true, because she became the matriarch of the Israelite tribes, the nation, her. It says in verse 61, then Rebekah arose with her maids and they mounted the camels, camels, and they followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and he departed. Now, what was going on on Isaac's side of the equation? Well, now Isaac uh, had come in from going to uh, uh, Bier Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev, the deserts of south of uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, and um, Isaac went out uh, to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, because in the, the desert you can see forever. And as he looks up into the, the desert, as he's beginning to meditate, he sees what? Camels. Camels. What's that mean? Did they get her? <laughs> Is it my future bride? Did God lead you? Did God guide you? Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. And she said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? I mean, he looks most interesting, you know? I'm, I'm adding to the text, okay? And the servant said, pridefully and joyously, he's my master. Tells you he's good looking. That's the man. And then she took her veil, and she covered her face. Why? Because she's a prudent young woman. And the servant told Isaac all these things that had happened. He told him the whole story. You're not going to believe it. Parked the ten camels. He prayed this prayer. She was the first one to walk up. She said the magic. Everything fell in place. The will of God. She's the one. They told her all that had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. She had passed away. Uh, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife eventually, and he loved her. Thus, Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Why? Because God said, son, it's 40 years. You're the son of promise. I'm giving you the right woman. Her name's Rebecca. You have to ask yourself, did Rebecca have baggage? Did she have issues? Have you read the rest of the story? Yeah, she did. Yeah, she did. Because she was kind of a manipulative person when she had two sons. What were their names? Jacob and Esau. Who, which one did she like? Jacob. Which one did Isaac like? Esau. Parental favoritism. Another story. So she had her own issues. But here's the point. God uses broken people. Amen. You hear me? God uses broken people to accomplish magnificent things. And she is a woman of faith uh, beyond all things. She follows God to where God said to go, marries Isaac, has two sons, Esau and Jacob. And from Jacob comes the 12 tribes of Israel. And from the 12 tribes of Israel comes one special tribe, Judah. Judah. Genesis 49 says that from the tribe of Judah shall come the Messiah, Shiloh, the king. Now imagine the math on this. This was around... Um, 2066 minus 40 years. That's when the time was, because uh, they theorized that uh, uh, Isaac was born around 2066. He was 40 years old. You do the math. What's this mean? For almost 2,000 years, God guided that little family all the way to 5 BC, the birth of a babe in a manger. And don't you know there was a camel there to say to his buddies, my lines totally got this. <laughs> He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. Are you worried about God in your life? He's always at work, weaving things wonderful, and he may surprise you. And hopefully this Christmas, he surprised you with the fact that he sent his son to be your savior. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the story of a camel uh, from an out-of-the-way narrative uh, that we might just breeze through on a given day. Thank you for just how you providentially worked in the lives of Isaac, in the life of uh, Rebecca, to bring them together so that one day, through all the camel journeys that they took, uh, there could be one camel that could see the birth of the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your providence and your guidance. And if one among us does not know the Messiah, might this be the day they come to bow in faith before him. And we who know you, might we walk uh, bravely and courageously through life's ups and downs, trusting that your leadership will always be perfect. And might we as parents train our children 
uh, how to choose mates and who to be looking for. And might we be in prayer for them as they go in the name of Christ. Amen.